A lot of people want to know and they're wondering why Putin is invading Ukraine. And there's a lot of, in my opinion, kind of bunk theories like he's trying to rebuild the Soviet Empire or he's just a madman like Hitler and he wants to take over the world. Um, what do you think about those theories? Uh, you need to look at the topographical map of the Russian space in Europe to get an idea of what he's after. So Russia has been invaded 50 odd time, invaded 50 odd times in its history. And all of the invasions have come through one of nine of what I call gateway territories that link the former Soviet space to the rest of the world. The Polish gap, the Bresser Arabian gap, those are two of the biggest ones. And they are unfortunately for the Ukrainians uh, on the far side of Ukraine from Russia. So per Putin's end goal here is to plug all nine of these gaps. Now, when the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, the Russians went from controlling all nine to just one. And bit by bit with the Kazakh conflict, with Nagorno-Karabakh, with the Georgia war, with the Crimean war, uh, they've added bits and pieces back to plugging those gateways. And if they get Ukraine in its totality, they will have merely plugged another two. Now, that does mean that Ukraine is not the end of the story. It's just the middle of the story. There, there's another war after this one. So he took over Crimea. That's essentially or annexed, I should say, Crimea. That's that's one Black Sea. We've got Odessa is the next on his list here in Ukraine. So that takes over, I guess, Ukraine's access to the Black Sea, but also gives Russia sort of unfettered access to that as well. And you also mentioned the demography, a terminal demography of Russia. Can you explain what this means? Nobody's really talking about this. Sure. So the geography explains the why. Uh, the why now is demographics. Uh, the Russians, well, I don't know if you've ever been to Russia, the, the, the climate is awful. Uh, and it's very difficult uh, in a modern society to function because you don't have rivers going the right directions. Uh, the, the winters are long and they're harsh. And so civilization in the way that we think of it is very expensive and they don't have any natural ways to generate capital on their own. So it's always been a very brute force approach and it took Stalin to industrialize what was then the Soviet Union. Uh, but that has a consequence. As you put, move people off of the farms and into cities, uh, kids go from being free labor to just being mobile, loud, expensive pieces of furniture. And you have less of them because adults can do math. So Russia in two generations went from having seven children per family to now under two. And that was before the bottom fell out in the post-Soviet collapse. And they're now down to about 1.4. The generation that collapsed in the 1990s is now so small that when it's their turn to have kids, there's not a whole lot that can happen. So this is kind of the last year that the Russians have a large enough cadre of people in their 20s to have a draft-based military. You wait any longer than this, and the, the Russians are going to have difficulties patrolling their own internal territories, much less fighting off any eternal, external aggressor. So while no one's expecting a war in the short term of somebody invading Russia, the Russians know that if they don't do this now, that no matter what the power balances are in the future, they will always be on the losing side. A lot of people might question whether or not that sort of thing matters in a world of missiles and air power. You know, like, who cares if you've got mountains on one side, if you've got people flying ICBMs and bombers overhead? That is absolutely spoken as an American. Yeah. We basically have a hemisphere to ourselves. I mean, our best friends are the Canadians to the north. Uh, our most integrated economy uh, neighbor is Mexico, not now our largest trading partner. Our second largest demographic partner Uh Russia's never been like that. Russia borders a dozen different countries, all of which have taken a crack at Russia at some point in the past. And hypersonics sound great until you realize that unless you put a nuke on the end of that, all you've done is blown up a building. And it's a very expensive way to blow up a building. So hypersonics really serve very little purpose in a conventional war. Jets do, and Russia's military reflects that. When you've got a large chunk of territory and you expect to be the defender, you have bottomless supplies of cheap disposable missile, or a cheap disposable jets. Uh, and to this point, there's no one on their borders who can match that. But the Germans are no slacks. That uh, the, the Swedes always punch above their weight. Uh, the Poles have a historical grudge to bear. The Iranians and the Turks have never been Russian friends. Uh, the Chinese almost got in a nuclear war with the Japanese in the past. And the Russians are still smarting over their war with Tokyo back in 1905. So from the Russian point of view, there is no horizon that is safe. And the hypersonics just aren't the weapon systems to balance that. The only reason that the Russians have done hypersonics is their logic is if it works, if, mm -hmm. then we have the ability to strike 
uh, the, the North American econ continent in a very short period of time. Um, I would argue, though, that what we've seen out of the Russian systems does not look all that promising uh, for no other reason than uh, either the Trump or the Biden administrations hasn't pushed for a new round of nuclear arms talks. Uh, because as soon as they started want, working on hypersonics, we started working on mm -hmm. hypersonics. And that was a program here that we shelved in the 70s. So it was very easy for us to get that back up and running again, whereas they were doing it from scratch. And if something is going to change the strategic balance that extremely, and the Russians know they can't keep up in the financial fight, you know they're going to be screaming for arms control because that's the only way they can achieve parity. So hypersonics are what, missiles that travel faster than the speed of sound? Is that what we're talking uh, about? As a rule, um, in most of the nomenclature, faster than Mach 5. Okay. So the idea is they have an intercontinental launch and then they glide down and then they're following the curvature of the Earth uh, to the point that it's very difficult to track them. And so they make the entire trip uh, to the United States in like 30 minutes or less. Oh, okay. Because I was going to say it sounds like pretty slow for a missile to go... What the speed of sound, 700 miles an hour, something like that? Yeah, I don't know. No. Yeah. Loads faster. Than okay. That. that makes way more sense. Wow. 30 minutes from Russia to the U.S. is, that sounds like something that's really hard to shoot out block. of the sky or block. Yeah. Yeah. Yikes. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're talking about needing to fire your interceptor before you see the missile. Uh, that's the whole idea of it. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And, and Russia, I don't know if this plays any role or how much you know about this, but a lot of alcoholism, a lot of substance abuse, like like but many countries have this, but in Russia, it's apparently even more intense, you know, by all accounts. And then they didn't really invest in their education. You've spoken about this, right? The military and their general education sector sort of stopped in the years after I was born and I'm 42. <laughs> uh, you, you didn't quite miss it. You're really close, though. Uh, so uh, let's start with the health. Um, the Russians, I don't want to say they're all alcoholics or anything like that, but no. you can buy shots of vodka in the subway to keep you warm on a winter morning uh, from wow. a little old lady that's just right there at the door. So okay. uh, well, the wow. idea that vodka solves all harms is definitely ingrained in this, into the society. Uh, in a long winter, low sun uh, climate like Russia, there are not a huge amount of vegetables and fruits in their diets, uh, a lot of saturated fats, and a lot of heroin. Uh, in per capita terms, Russia is probably the second most addicted country in the world. And because the bottom fell out of the healthcare system post-Soviet, uh, they also have the highest tuberculosis rates in the world. Probably one in four Russians carry the TB bacteria Whoa. in, bac in bacillus form. Uh, and it's not the TB that we know here in the United States. It's multi-drug resistant. So you're talking about needing two years of antibiotics at the cost of several thousand dollars a person to get off of it. And they just don't have the income for that. Uh, HIV, they used to be one of the most infected countries in the world, and then they stopped uh, collecting data. So we haven't had a good update on that in 15 years, but at that time, it would look like the people of reproductive age, upwards of a fifth of the population may have been exposed, but we really just don't know. Uh, education. So, um, in the 1980s, uh, especially after 1983, uh, the Russians were facing a simultaneous strategic and financial crunch. And the only way they could make the, the, the strategic picture work it was by having some sort of peace with the United States. They had outspend themselves for 30 years. And so they were, they were flat broke. And because you don't just go from, you know, that is my ideological foe, that's the country that's been threatening me with nuclear weapons for 50 years, to, yeah, we can talk now. You don't do that in a year. Uh, it took two, um, two premiers dying of old age before they could finally make that offer. So in the meantime, they just tried to spend their way out of their strategic embroglio, and it didn't work. It bankrupted them. And so they had to figure out where to cut. Well, they couldn't cut the military because they weren't really ready to make peace. They couldn't cut the nuclear facilities because they weren't ready to make peace. They couldn't cut their oil and natural gas production because that was their only source of income. So they cut education. Uh, in Russia, the educational system is different from here. So here you go to high school, you go to college, maybe you go to grad school, you enter the workforce and, you know, you're earning money from day one, hopefully. Well, you're pick, yeah, you picked up there. a couple hundred grand worth of debt along the way, but whatever. Fair that's enough. beyond, yeah, beyond Fair the enough. point. Uh, but in Russia, there was a technical training uh, that was done in their high schools that is not done in the United States as a rule. Uh, and then you become an apprentice. And you have an apprenticeship for four or five, six years before you go on and get your grown-up job of being an accountant or an engineer or whatever it happened to be. Well. The high school technical training collapsed around 1985. That's when all these cuts happened, just as Gorbachev was coming to power. Which meant that 
there was no one that could be taken as an apprentice uh, right out of high school. You would have to train them up additionally. And so the, the, the labor force got very thin and the educational system was never repaired. And yet the post-Soviet collapse where pretty much everything was canceled. Uh, and you fast forward to now and the youngest group of people who have had that technical training and had a good apprenticeship and actually had a real adult job, you know, they're in their late fifties. And it's far too late at this point to regenerate that. They've tried a couple of times with hiccups here and there. It's never really stuck because it was never for more than a small subsector like software coding uh, or a very specific group of people like friends of Putin's kids. Uh, and as long as that's been the situation, you know, you're not getting the millions of new workers that are skilled that you need every single year. Two million workers also moved out. Uh, in the aftermath of the Soviet collapse, they were all young and they were all skilled. And we've probably had about a quarter million Russians flee so far during the Ukraine war, which again, were young and skilled and they were absolutely irreplaceable. So, you know, you fast forward just a year or three and we're talking about the Russians having to make some very real choices about what to let drop. Oil and natural gas, food production, uh, the military component, the strategic missile forces. They can't keep all of these things up and running. And I, I don't want to overanalyze this because we just don't have very good information. We're only in three, three of the year, three, week three of the war. Right. There's a case to be made that their military commanders are something they decided to let drop. In which case, that was probably the wrong thing at this time. But we've seen an Iraqi level of military coordination and logistics uh, in the war so far. Uh, it's, it's abysmal. It's, it's underperformed what every analyst I have spoken with has ever guessed the Russians were capable of. Yeah, it doesn't look so good. And, and some, I'm kind of aware that watching Western news sources and even Euro, you know, European, not just American news sources, there's probably a fair amount of bias towards we want to cheer for the underdog and things like that. And we want we want it to look like Ukraine is is doing well in this conflict. But it's really hard to find something that is contra to that narrative. That's not straight off of RT or from like a Kremlin right. source directly. I, trust your instincts on that. Yeah. I have no doubt that there's some selective reporting, conscious or unconscious going on. No, no argument on there. But the point is, Kharkiv is still there. Mirapol is still there. They've been under shelling for 20 days. There's been a dozen assaults on Kiev. All of them have been repulsed. But the real big one for me was that 40 mile long convoy. It stalled a day in because it ran out of gas. And then two days later, the Russian troops abandoned it and walked back to Belarus because they ran out of food. That should not happen to the tip of your spear. Yeah, yeah the, to me, it looks like, and this is wild speculation, how do you not know that you don't have enough gas or food? I mean, you have to know going into it, or somebody does, but maybe that person was the person that sold the gas and the food and went, uh, let's just play this one by ear, right? There's a, there's a large history of corruption throughout the Russian system, the military included, but we thought, and when I say we, I mean everyone who's ever studied Russia in the last 30 years, we thought they learned all those lessons after Grozny. We thought they learned them after the Second Chechen War, because by the end of the Second Chechen War in 2001, they weren't doing this anymore. But here we are 20 years later, and despite a couple significant international deployments, and all of a sudden it feels like we're back in 1993. Yeah, it, it, to me, it doesn't quite make sense. And there's a lot of different theories like, oh, well, they didn't really want to fight, so they're headed back, or there's a lot of people that are ideologically opposed to this, so they're not going to fight, or they're self-sabotaging. But even if you've got a 40-mile convoy of vehicles, even if, let's say, a quarter of these people are self-sabotaging and don't want to fight, there's 75% of your forces is still left which is already much larger than anything Ukraine could muster. What happened to them? Like, where did they go? Why did well, they go back to building? If the number is 25%, that's more than enough. Because if you're all advancing down a, a single highway, three or four vehicles blocking a convoy, everybody just has to stop. I mean, just the, the very approach to this is not a problem necessarily with just logistics. It, it shows a level of incompetence on strategic thinking. You know, you're talking a thousand plus vehicles in a single file line, 40 miles long. I'm yeah. sorry, that's idiotic. Uh, and here we are. So it's it's looking like a catastrophic failure to perform across the entire system. I, I know that Russia has a, like a whole division of the army that's essentially like, I guess, a rail corps. What do you call it? Where they build tracks in and it's temporary, but they build them fast. The whole point is they want to be able to run trains in because that's what they've been doing for a hundred years is building trains so they can run in 
t- huge amounts of tanks. They don't have to drive them on a highway and run out of gas. What happened right. to those? But you you, you have to secure the land first. Because right. if okay. you get one stick of dynamite under one railroad tie and you set it off at the right moment, uh, the train pileup that happens because of that is absolutely epic. Right. So you only do that once you've actually pacified the countryside. And I would argue in the case of Ukraine, that's not going to happen. Yeah, like ever. It, yeah, I mean, it's, there's there's a certain degree of insurgency. I mean, let me let me back up. Mm-hmm. The Ru- the Russians are going to still win despite all of this. They outnumber the Ukrainians. They've got better equipment. They've got shorter supply lines. They don't have to worry about controlling their borders in order to keep the resources coming. They can suck up a huge amount of casualties, and Russian society will not rebel. Remember, it wasn't until you had almost a million dead in World War One that we had any inkling of political problems back in Russia. We're nowhere close to that. And a lot of Russians agree with what Putin is doing, either for nationalist regions or for strategic reasons. So uh, these reports that we do see about uh, people fleeing Russia, they are true. There are dissidents. They are not going to win. So far, all of the protests combined, still talking less than one-tenth of one percent of the population. That doesn't move the needle in a dictatorship. Right, yeah, that's a good point. Uh, And so Russia is going to win this, and then they're going to have to pacify the country. And the question is, what level of internal violence and sabotage are they willing to tolerate in order to move on to the next stage of the war? And that's where things get interesting from the NATO point of view. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If there's there's one thing that was coloring American decision-making on all things Russian, it's that they were maybe not a peer force, but a near peer force. And we would have to be very careful how we operated. We would have to be at the top of our game if we weren't going to have horrendous casualties. All of a sudden, that logic's gone out the window. And we now know that if American forces and Russian forces meet on the field of battle, the Russian forces will be obliterated. And if that happens, the only thing the Russians, the only choice the Russians have is between a humiliating strategic withdrawal to do whatever the Americans say or up the ante with nukes. And so from the American, from the White House, from the DOD's point of view, this has gotten a lot scarier than we ever thought it would be. Because all of a sudden, if we can't keep Russia locked down in Ukraine, if we can't bleed them there till they die, if we can't make it out of their reach so that they can then go on and do the next series of targets, then there will be a direct American-Russian confrontation that we can't avoid because these are NATO allies. So the NATO strategy, the White House strategy now is to ship every piece of military equipment that we can that doesn't require a static physical resupply or launching point like a plane. So drones are good, anti-tank missiles are good, stingers are good, anything like that's great, send it all. Because as long as Russia is bogged down in a bloodbath in Ukraine, they can't go to the next step, and that's where the American troops are. We yeah. have to prevent that from happening. Interesting. Yeah, I think you wrote something, and I'll, I'll paraphrase here, so correct me if I mess it up, but perhaps the biggest change in recent years is this. The United States ha- now has an interest in a Russian assault because it would be Russia's last war. We talked about the demographics. Demographics have told us for 30 years that the United States will not only outlive Russia, but do so easily. The question has always been how to manage Russia's decline with an eye towards avoiding gross destruction. A Russian-Ukrainian war would keep the bulk of the Russian army bottled up in an occupation that would be equal parts desperate and narcissistic and protracted until such a time that Russia's terminal demography, the aging sort of population we talked about, transforms that army into a powerless husk. And all that would transpire on a patch of territory in which the United States has minimal strategic interests. Ukraine, essentially. Right. And and the reason is because we don't... I hate saying it like this because it's so cold and callous, but here we are. We don't, quote unquote, need Ukraine, but we also are not tied to defending it. You know, it's not Poland. It's not Latvia and Lithuania or a NATO country where we have to honor Article 5. You know, we are, it's almost like if we can put Russia, we, if Russia puts itself through this meat grinder and we keep that meat grinder powered on for another, I don't know, five years, there's not, or or three, there's nothing left. There will be nothing left of Russia, Russia's armed forces. Sorry. That logic hasn't changed. The only thing that has changed is that um, because the Russians now appear so weak, the degree of desperation that might exist in their strategic thinking is something that we really hadn't taken into account earlier. What about the leadership cadre of Russia? You mentioned something interesting, which is I think the United States has 
countless, I will say, pol politicians or people that could go into politics. And in Russia— More than we need. <laughs> yeah, certainly more than we need. Certainly more than anybody ever asked for, right? Um, but Russia has the opposite problem where you're counting three-digit number of people that could do this. Why? It's the same basic concept as what's going on with the military and the economy. You know, the, the last group of people who have the full suite of training uh, were trained in the mid-1980s. In the case of uh, the leadership specifically, we're talking about all people from the KGB. Uh, when Yuri Andropov took over in the early 1980s, it was a bit of an internal coup in that we had uh, one faction that used to be part of the government take over the government because they thought that the previous two rulers, Khrushchev and Brezhnev, had mismanaged the system so badly that people, that they really needed adults in the room, people who had the full picture of everything that was going on. And in a highly censored totalitarian dictatorship, that meant the intelligence services. So the KGB generated Yuri Andropov, uh, Chernenko, and ultimately Gorbachev, all from the, the KGB, uh, to run the system. Well, these people stayed in, I wouldn't even call it the background. They weren't officially in charge, but they were always large and present in the 1990s. And when Yeltsin took ill, they're the ones who took over from Yeltsin. So we had a, a quick revolution, lasted a few years, then Yeltsin got... Uh, dropped because his health, health was atrocious, uh, and the KGB has been in the the, FS, the, uh, the KGB's successor, the FSB, has been in charge of ever since. Now Putin is obviously from that crowd, but so has everyone around him. Uh, Alexei Miller of Gazprom is probably the best example, but uh, the, the chiefs of all of the major companies that the uh, that they're called the Silovarks, the security oligarchs, uh, that have taken over chunks of the Russian economy in large bites ever since 1999. They are all personally beholden to Putin. They are all from that inner circle, and they are all over 50. Uh, so there is not a generation waiting in the wings that has been trained. Putin has been very effective at pruning any potential challengers to his rule. So he will be the last capable competent president of the Russian Federation. He's already 70. Yikes. Yeah. So if you've, there's like no secession plan theoretically no. that looks credible. And every once in a while, we have a faction within that group that kind of rises to prominence because they want to succeed. And as soon as Putin thinks they might be get closer to succeed, succeed him, he smashes them. And yeah. So right now, we haven't had anybody like that for a few years. Yeah, they they tie themselves to a chair and go, fall in a pool. a pool. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's really it's really interesting to see this because you would think he. I mean, even North Korea has been like, "Hey, I should probably come up with something for when I croak," and here we are with Putin. Really, I, I mean, what's the plan? Really, he has to have some plan, right, or not? I mean, if you look at the demographics, it is perfectly reasonable to assume that Putin was going to be the last leader of Russia anyway. Mm -hmm. So if you're just if you're just staying in power to be the person to turn the that to be the person who will turn the lights off. I've yeah, I guess things. I guess here we are. So yeah. what happens to Russia after Putin? I mean, even if he's the most successful tyrant and ends up taking over all the countries he's aiming at, and we'll talk about that in a second. Eventually, time is going to catch up with a guy. So what happens to Russia after that? In fighting? The, the best case scenario is we get something a little bit like what happened after Mao left in China, like a, a gang of four from the different factions who rules as a committee, and then one of the four offs the other three, and then he's in charge. That's kind of the best case scenario now. I, I think it'd be more likely that Putin has so removed everyone of leadership talent that we're probably going to have a, more of an organizational collapse. Uh, Igor Sechin of Rosneft, that's the state oil company, is probably the most capable who's left, but everyone else of the 150 KGB members that are left so thoroughly hate him in all things that it's really doubtful that he'd be able to rally anyone to his flag. So there really is no one. He doesn't seem super adept at picking leadership, or maybe I'm looking at the wrong criteria, but when I look at, at dipshits like Ramzan Kadyrov, who runs Chechnya, I'm just seeing the dumb guy at the gym who starts fights with everyone and has no career outside of lifting weights running a, a supposedly separate country, and I'm just thinking, this is probably the last pick for a kickball guy who's so insecure, it's, he's shouting, it's, it's like he's on Twitter starting beefs with Elon Musk. <laughs> 
what the hell is going on, and you're picking this guy in a leadership role. Yeah. To me, that it just also says, sounds a lot like an American position. We we, yeah. we we look at leadership different than the Russians do. The strong man is who rules Russia. It always has been. Uh, the terrain does not lead to regional leaders, I'm sorry, or regional economics that are separate. So like, you know, here, Texas, New York, California, Florida, Minnesota, these are all discrete economic entities. And so we have a federal system where each – of the states chooses their own leadership and then submits uh, their leadership choices uh, at a representative level uh, to Washington. That would never work in the Russian Federation. In the Federation, you've got Moscow, you've got St. Petersburg, and then you have all these secondary cities that are dependent upon some degree of link to one of those two, and all of them have been conquered by Russia over the course of their existence, every single one of them. Russia is not a republic. It's certainly not a democracy. It's a multi-ethnic empire. And with that sort of political and economic footing, someone's in charge. And if someone's not in charge, no one's in charge. And the future of Russia, in my opinion, is probably going towards the latter. But for now, it means that you have a strongman in the center who appoints regional strongmen like Kadyrov uh, to look after things for him. Uh, this is not about growth. This is not about jobs. This is not about popularity. This is about control. That that makes a lot more sense because look, otherwise none of my all my logic is turned on its head when i look at this guy right it just doesn't make any sense but i guess if you've got somebody else credibly running the secret police and the secret service and monitoring this guy and all he's supposed to do is smash dissidents with a ham fist then i guess he's probably the right guy for the job right yeah, and from putin's point of view uh choosing Kadyrov's father because that was who he originally appointed back in 2001 as his successor uh was smart because he turned one faction of the chechens against the other chechen factions and together with the russian military they were able to break them all and so that faction was rewarded with control over a personal fiefdom, very medieval, very Middle Ages, very feudalistic. Um, of course, as is will always happen to fathers, they will pass on in time. Uh, Kadyrov Sr. was assassinated. And so Kadyrov Jr., the current guy, took over. And yes, this guy is dumb as a bag of snakes. There's, mm -hmm. there's no argument there. Um, but he is proven rem re relentlessly capable of keeping Chechnya in line. So Chechnya is no longer functionally part of the Russian Federation from an economic point of view, but the independence push was squelched. And Kadyrov regularly participates uh, with Moscow when it comes to security issues. Uh, specifically, uh, Putin relies upon the Chechens to assassinate people in Russia who he finds politically inconvenient. Yeah, we've I've read a, a bunch of books about Putin, and it, whenever somebody gets stabbed within view of the Kremlin and all the cameras that are for security happen to be off, it just has Chechen, just has Chechen marks all over it. Or what? What was the theater where a, a bunch of Chechens rolled in with explosives? And it, it sort of there's rumors now that maybe they weren't even real, except for they were all murdered at the end. Well, well, that that's pre Kadyrov. Um, that, yeah, that was back in 2000. The, the theater situation. There were about 500 people who were in the theater. Uh, a bunch of Chechen. Um, terrorists, there's no other word, mm -hmm. uh, came in with uh, explosive strap to them. And because the Russians, let's just say that they're, they're the emphasis that American hostage rescuers have on rescuing the hostages, that, that, that mindset doesn't really exist in Russia. So uh, the Russian military just gassed the theater uh, and killed three quarters of the uh, hostages and then went in with gas masks and shot everyone who had an explosive vest. Yeah, yeah. There was, I think, Masha Gessen had written something, and I could be misattributing this, had written something where it just didn't look like the Chechens were the, they didn't look like they were expecting this, like any kind of raid at all. Like, I think their weapons were essentially unloaded, or the explosives weren't actually armed. There was some sort of, this again could be one of those rumor things, but it was almost like, they were surprised when they got executed? Well, uh, they had real weapons and they had real vests and they had killed real people before the gas was released. Mm. And, and from the Russian point of view, this was broadly a success. So I don't mean to suggest that there's a conspiracy there. Now, whether or not they were ready for it, that's fair. Yeah. Uh, the, the conspiracy theory that if you're going to pay attention when you should pay attention to is that back in 19, 1999, a couple of uh, apartment blocks in Moscow were blown up. Uh, no one in Chechnya claimed credit for it and the chechens had kind of screamed all of their bombings and successes from the rooftops for every other tech they'd ever done uh but putin blamed the chechens for them and used that to whip up uh, russian public opinion into a frenzy and launch the second chechen war so did putin do it his own people 
considering his ethical standards, mm-hmm. I don't think it should be ruled out, but there's certainly no proof one way or the other. Yeah, that, that was the one, I think, where the, the police had investigated this and they found that th- the explosives belonged to some training regiment of domestic security, and then they just immediately stopped investigating because it looked like they almost caught themselves. Yeah, it, it was wrapped up very quickly. So, yeah. yeah if, if you want to dig for something suspicious, I would recommend digging there. Yeah, yeah. That is, again, sort of conspiracy theory. I don't usually dabble in that stuff, but, you know, it's hard not to when you're talking about Putin and Russia. Russia. It's, it's really, yeah, because <laughs> sometimes it's like, well, there really is a conspiracy. Look at that. Um, so how screwed is Russia even if they win in Ukraine, right? They got terminal demography, but how do they get out of this? Are they able to do that? U- Ukraine's, again, just this is the middle war. So, you know, yeah. Nagorno Karabakh, Georgia, Crimea, Kazakhstan, these are all kind of in their back pocket now. Uh, Ukraine, even control of all of Ukraine doesn't solve the problem on the Western Front. Uh, they would, in addition, need uh, Moldova, the northeastern sliver of Romania, that's part of the Bessarabian Gap. That's how the Turks have often invaded. Uh, they would also need eastern Poland, right up into downtown Warsaw on the Vistula River. That's the Polish gap. That's where the Nazis like to invade it. And then they would need Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania in totality because that's how the Swedes have gotten in the past. So you're talking about six more countries, five which are members of NATO. Obviously, that's where things get very dicey. I mean, they can probably capture Moldova in a long weekend, although looking at the military effectiveness so not so far, maybe I should extend that out to a month. Yeah, spring break at least. Yeah. yeah. Um, but for the other five, if Ukraine is able to keep the fire lit, then the Russians aren't going to have enough conventional forces to do this. And the only thing worse than having a Russia that didn't try to do this and just kind of shrivels in time would be a Russia that leapt forward, launched the war, paid all the prices for the war, and still remained strategically unmoored. So there's a a point we're going to get to in a few months, probably later this year, um, certainly next year, uh, where the Russians will have digested Ukraine and Moldova to their satisfaction, their plan, Mm -hmm. uh, and then they'll have that clash with NATO. And that's when the nukes become a very real question. Right, because this is the Russia can expand or Russia can die, Catherine the Great quote, where they have to control all these borders. But yeah, so you're saying... Essentially, once they get to those NATO borders, they still need to take those NATO countries in order to plug those gaps. And they're obviously not able to do that conventionally, so they have to resort to right. nuclear Think weapons. about what the Russians did in Crimea. They started moving in troops. It was apparent that the populations were russified enough that they were not going to resist. And when talk in the West started coming around about, you know, we're going to back dissident forces like, say, the, uh, the Crimean Tatars, who are basically Turkish, um, the, the Russians snarled, well, that will mean an end to all energy and uh, imports from the West into, I'm sorry, energy exports from Russia into Europe, at which point uh, Angela Merkel in one of her more ignoble moments said, no, Crimea is Russia's. Uh, We will have a level of sanctions that will not approach anything that causes economic pain to either side, and we are going to call it there. Mm. Uh, That is no longer an option. So strategic weapons are now on the table for that threat. Yeah, interesting. There's irony there with Germany appeasing somebody who is slightly reminiscent of somebody who who was also, well, Austrian technically, but back who had a similar but uh, slightly more eastward plan. Uh, well, German do- and Russian history is always about trying to find ways to work together so they don't fight, and then not, uh, not working, so then they fight. Right. But then that doesn't work, so they try to find ways to work together so they don't fight. This is like the ninth cycle. <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe someone should learn at some point that this isn't going to work. Um, yeah, but I mean, what's your alternative? Yeah, I guess try that's to, true. Try not to fight, and then that fails, so you fight. That fails, so you go back. It's this is this is the back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, and that's why the countries that are between the Russians and the Germans hate history so much. Yikes! Yeah, that's where my family's from, and they moved. I wonder why. Uh, <laughs> something, something pogrom, something, something world war, then another one, and then they went. You know, screw this place, basically. Um, actually, it was before the Second World War, but. Yeah, pogroms will do that to you. So can Russia occupy Ukraine? I mean, theoretically they can, right? But they need like their entire armed forces to do that, correct? You've got a country of, well, at the start, it was a country of 45 million people. Ukraine. We're now down to Ukraine, yes. We're now down to 42.5 million people. It's the biggest movement of people ever recorded in human history. 
two and a half million people in under three weeks. That, that, that's just unprecedented. And we are nowhere near done because right now the fighting is only happening on less than one fifth of Ukrainian territory. Wow. Yeah. Ukraine we, is huge. Yeah. We haven't even gotten to the part of Russia or of Ukraine that before three weeks ago, we considered the pro Western part. As a rule, it's not perfect, but the river, the Dnieper that cuts the country roughly in half, the, the general understanding was if you're west of that, you're pro-Western and you consider yourself primarily Ukrainian. And if you're east of that, you're pro-Russian and you consider yourself at least a Russian speaker. Uh, what the Russians have done in the last eight years and having this low intensity war in Ukraine and the Donbass has changed that. And everyone in Ukraine is now broadly considering a Ukrainian and outside of Russian TV, there's no one in Ukraine that is not resisting in some way. I mean, this, this is just an epic turnaround from a national identity point of view. So Russia is going to not just have to level the entire place. They're going to have to continually bomb and launch programs the length of the entire country to remain, retain control. That's going to generate at least another 10 million refugees, and that's going to require at least a couple million Russian soldiers to occupy the place, and that's the vast bulk of the Russian military. That includes their draftees. So we're not just talking about the best Russian troops completely being locked up. We're talking about nearly all Russian troops being locked up unless the Russians issue a state of emergency and um, start drafting anyone under age 50 which is probably where this is going to go because wow. the Russian economy is in free fall anyway. So why not? That would be, I, I mean, to have people who are, let's say 50 years old, having to actually do something that requires what might approach combat, because again, they might just be standing in a town or in front of a school guarding things, but they're going to be a target. People are going to be going after them. They're going to have no training. They're probably going to have five bullets in their pockets, some of which have gotten wet 7,000 times over the course of the last few decades that they've existed, right? I mean, these are, this just sounds like a, a giant mess waiting to happen. That's Again, just going to add from to the, the Russian account. point of view, this is about national survival. Right. And right. Can you imagine? I mean, there, there's no comparison in the American historical experience for something like this. When it comes to demographic collapse, it's, it's never happened to a major power before. So, you know, the, the, the statistician in me is looking on at this fascination. It's like, okay, well, it's, you know, the only country with a worse demography than Russia is China. What happens there in a few years? Because that's not that far off. That's within a decade. Uh, but Russia is going to give us some interesting signposts that we can use to evaluate other countries that are in a similar demographic decline. Wow. Wow, the, two million troops is bigger than Afghanistan and Iraq put together. Is that not? Is oh, that true? By, uh, we yeah. never had more than one hundred and ten thousand troops in Iraq, and never more than ninety-five thousand in Afghanistan. So I'm off by a factor of twenty. That's par for the course for this show. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Hey, if you like what you're hearing and seeing, check out the Jordan Harbinger Show podcast feed. There's a lot more just like this. You can find the Jordan Harbinger Show in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Now, back to the show. So so how the hell do they get out of it? I mean, did, uh, the stronger relationship with China that Russia's been asking for, is that going to be significant? Or do you think China's going to say, you're on the losing side of this. I'm not really, I don't really want to rock the boat. Here's a token gesture of some gasoline. Well, we, we've got a similar problem in China that we do to Russia in that the leader has isolated themselves to the degree that they're not getting good information anymore. And Xi has done that with a cult of personality in addition. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, what's probably the best example is he'll, he'll give orders to different groups of bureaucrats of things he wants done. They'll go out and do it. And if those orders down the line clash, no one reports back up because nobody wants Xi to be looking at them. Uh, so when the power outages, for example, happened last, uh, last May in, uh, in China, at one point, one third of the country was experiencing rolling black and brownouts. It looks that, like Xi didn't know until September. Really? Yeah, and we didn't get our first policy to deal with it until February. Yeah, a lot of my Chinese lessons were canceled because they would say, we don't have power. I'd say, what about your phone? We can just do it on your phone. And they're like, no, you don't understand. There's no power anywhere. It's not just my apartment. There's not a breaker that I got to go flip. There's no power. I'm looking out the window. It's dark. It's, <laughs> there's nothing on. So in a system like that, where the, the first, the only leader that she had face-to-face -face contact with since January of 2000 was Putin at the Olympics. Uh, and then Putin apparently just lied to his face. And no one in 
uh, Xi's inner circle or within the intelligence apparatus or within the foreign ministry wanted to tell Xi, oh yeah, they're moving troops to the border. Oh yeah, it looks like they're going to go. They just heard what the story was from Putin. That is what Xi had been presented with and no one contradicted. So the degree of complete policy failure we can expect out of China should be catastrophically entertaining. Uh, and I think we're seeing that now and think with the food system and the electricity system, we're probably gonna see it with the port system here really soon. Uh, sorry, I'm getting away from your question. No, no, that's, that's Help interesting. Help the Russians. So entertaining is not quite the word I was looking for though. I mean, there, there are other, there are real people at the end of this that don't wanna live there or, or that don't need to be living under a, you know, Mao 2.0. Um, but I understand well, what you it's, mean. It's too late for that. But yeah, it is too late for that. Uh, I, I but, always, I always try to look at look. I, there's so many Russians. My, you know, half my family's Chinese, Taiwanese. I, it's it's really hard to, but it's really important to separate the Russian people who are living in a hellish crap hole environment right now because of their leadership, and the Chinese who are doing the same. I mean, yes, people will say, "What about America?" This, but at the same time, like probably nobody other than Ukraine is really r wishing for like a huge number of dead Russians because it's not really. I, well, I, I would argue whenever the term what about is used that you're dealing with somebody who doesn't have a good understanding of where they're coming from. For That's sure. What, what about ism? I agree is garbage. I, I'm just trying to say this isn't about wishing for dead Russians or starving Chinese. Like we've seen that movie and it's ugly it, it, at the end of the day. Yeah, no argument there. Uh, the thing was, we don't know what he's going to do because he doesn't know what he's going to do because he's not getting good information. So the, the people are saying that, you know, Putin is talking to the voices in his head. There's some truth to that. But for the most part, there is a cadre. They are intelligent. It's just not a lot of people. With Xi, there's no one. So predicting what the Chinese are going to do is kind of an exercise in futility. I see. And there's, there's really nothing else that the Russians can give the Chinese. The Chinese have already reverse engineered all their weapons. Uh, the pipelines to China are already running at full capacity. The rail system is already running at full capacity. The only other way to get more stuff would be if you load it at a uh, Russian Western port, say St. Petersburg or Novorossiysk, which is their shallow ports, their small boats, then somewhere at sea, you transfer the cargo from a small vessel to a larger one, sail it around Africa, because you can't use Suez, all the way to China. So, you know, you're just the cost of that, the logistics of that, getting around insurance companies and shipping companies, they'd have to charter everything themselves, insure everything themselves, and running routes that are four and five times as long as all their other supply routes are. So just the volume of stuff that you might be able to increase to Beijing is just minuscule. So all that is left from the Chinese point of view is, you know, how long is Russia a useful distraction away from people ganging up on China? Because on day one of this war, the Chinese were really, really excited. Because like, oh my God, this is going to show just how weak the West is. This is going to show how Russia can take an entire country and walk away with everything that it had before. And that is just so false now. And the Chinese know that if they try something on Taiwan, they are far more vulnerable to the sanction packages that the United States has now led than the Russians are. Because at the end of the day, the Chinese still import roughly 80% of their energy and 80% of the inputs that allow them to feed their population. So if you do something like we've done against Russia, against China, not only does the Chinese system collapse in a matter of months, they've lost 500 million people from famine within a year. And they now know that. So the, the nationalist chest beating that we've been seeing more and more and more has gotten very circumspect. And they're just focusing on amplifying the Chinese, I'm sorry, the Russian propaganda on Chinese news stations because they really don't know what else to do because they're seeing 50 years of strategic planning the Russians have torched in a month. And that's got to hurt. Yeah, good Lord. Yeah, this the idea that China might invade Taiwan, my family has been increasingly worried about this. I've been less worried about it because you'd have to be even more crazy than crazy looking than Putin to think now's a good time to do that, especially given that like Russia can withstand some sh some sanctions for some time. China, the last thing they want to do is torpedo their own economy. A and a lot of people say, well, the West can't afford to sanction them, but I'm not sure. What do you think about that? 
the biggest hit that we would feel um, from the American side of things would be in tech manufacturing because that's all been outsourced to East right. Asia. But very, very painfully little of the value add is done in China. There's much more done in the rest of the Asian countries. So I'm not suggesting that we would walk away and not feel the difference. Uh, like iPhone has, for example, completely doubled, tripled, and quadrupled down. Anytime there's been a problem with China, they've put in more money. Stupid will cost them the company in the end, but it's really the only company that's gone that far. Uh, for everybody else, when you're talking about electronics and widgets and telephones, uh, yeah, it's gonna hurt. Uh, but that's the only sector. And there's nothing about the technology that is required to do that that we can't do in the Western Hemisphere with the exception of low-end semiconductors. And I'm kind of counting on Vietnam to fill that gap uh, because they're moving up the value-added scale so quickly, so much quite faster than the Chinese did. Um, but aside from that, you know, food, no. Energy, no. Um, tech, no finance, we'd probably actually get a huge surge just like we did after the Asian financial crisis. So in most sectors, there would be disruptions, but it would be even short-term gains for the American market. Uh, but in, uh, in electronics and computing manufacturing, that is where we would feel it. That's unavoidable. Yeah, and that's a huge sector. I mean, tech companies have global markets. I don't know what percentage or share of U.S. GDP it is, but it's probably not small. Um, it's so, less yeah. than two. Really? I'm yeah, surprised all to hear that. All manufacturing as a component of trade is less than 2% of GDP. Remember, only about 15% of U.S. GDP total is involved in international trade. I did not know that. Okay, yeah. well, wow. The single biggest sector of that 15% is energy. And not necessarily imports. It's like the United States, Canada, and Mexico import and export among them. That's counted in that number. And then the next biggest part will be manufacturing it again in and out of Mexico and Canada. So if you remove the NAFTA economies, and if you remove energy from the math, you're really talking less than 5% of GDP for everything else combined. Why didn't we outsource things to Mexico, such as the iPhone manufacturing? Why did the tech go to China? There must be a compelling reason for this. Sure, there's a couple reasons. Uh, number one, um, you may remember back to the Mexican-American War, we took half their territory and they still, that's still smart. Okay, and I understand And so there's that. always been this strand in Mexican political thought, which is hard to deny, uh, that the Americans can't necessarily be trusted. Um, and we've not always, not always been the best of neighbors. Uh, in the ideology as it evolved during the Cold War, that meant when the United States created the globalized order and everyone joined it in order to get to economic goodies and security protection, Mexico didn't because they still didn't trust us. So it wasn't until the, the, the tequila crisis of 1985, um, I'm sorry, 1995, and the negotiation of the NAFTA accords, which thank God Canada convinced us to bring the Mexicans into that. So 1995 is kind of the magic year when the Mexicans really took it seriously and started integration. And since then, they've become our largest trading partner. And I'd say, you know, are fast on their way to becoming one of our, our, our fastest friends. Um, that's kind of the, the first big piece. Uh, the second big piece is uh, Mexico, from a topographical point of view, is not like the United States. So, you know, we'll have like a regional city. Let me just pick one out of the air, Des Moines. And it's surrounded by a series of suburbs and then beyond that, small towns. Because, you know, it rains in Iowa. And so you have farms and you have townhouses and small towns. It doesn't rain in Northern Mexico, it's, it's desert. And so you've got a series of isolated population communities and in a pre-integration NAFTA system that made education really difficult. Cause I mean, you might have an island of educated people but then nothing else for hundreds of miles. Hmm. That makes it really hard to do value added. So when, when you say value added, can you tell us sort of what that def definition is? Sure. You're like take, taking some sort of raw material and turn it into an intermediate product or taking that intermediate product and adding value to it and include it into a larger material. So steel into wire, uh, spark plugs into a carburetor unit, that kind of thing. Okay. Gotcha. Uh, so 1995 is really when the Mexicans started on that path. And since they didn't have the tech or the capital, it was up to Americans to come into Mexico, set up factories in league with local Mexican workers and bigwigs and produce. Now, the Mexicans since then have taken it and run with it. It's one of the best uh, urbanization, excuse me, the best modernization stories we've got. Uh, but they still are limited by those pockets of population. And so they don't have any of them that are large enough with a big enough cadre of skilled labor to do something like high-end electronics. There just isn't a national or regional history of large-scale precision manufacturing. So the U.S. does the high-end chips. Thailand and Malaysia do the mid-level chips. And China does all the low-end. 
no one in North America can take that from China because we don't have the labor structure for it. Gotcha. Ours, ours is too well skilled and the Mexicans are skilled differently. So I really do look to countries like Vietnam to kind of plug the gap, but you don't do that in a year. When we're talking about low end semiconductors, high end, I assume, is like an Intel chip that's inside or an Apple M1. Low end is what is that what's in like a TV remote? There's a semiconductor probably. or 10 in here. Probably right? anything that's yeah. part of the Internet of Things is probably from a Chinese fab facility. Gotcha. OK, yeah, I was just curious about that because I, I didn't even realize there were other sorts of chips. I did read that the U.S. threatened to shut down China with respect to semiconductors. And there was a lot of speculation that we couldn't do that. But um, it depends uh, on how you define semiconductor. Right, right. That's what it so sounds like. In mm -hmm. the United States, we only make 11 percent of the world's chips by number, but we make 60% by value. So if it's going into your a high-end phone, if it is going into a laptop or a server, that is definitely American, an American chip or maybe from Taiwan, Singapore, sorry, Taiwan, South Korea, or Japan. If it's going into your car or your plane, something where the it doesn't have to be nearly as small because you've got some room to work with, that's probably out of Thailand and Malaysia. And if it's your blender singing when you're, you've pureed to a certain level of consistency, that's definitely out of China. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. And Reddit to the rescue has explained that it's really hard actually to dump firmware from a properly protected semiconductor or a microprocessor. So you can't just like rip the thing open and attach wires to it and say, ah, that's how this thing works. Let's make these. Let's just make these. You can't really do it. And the firmware is almost always heavily encrypted. That's one of the reasons why, I mean, hackers might be able to grab it, but then they have to grab all the new designs, which what, change every six months and are doubling in yeah, power? Well, think of it this way too. If you've got a high-end chip, let's say you are in China and you've got a dozen people who can break it down, hack into it, figure out how it was put together and come up with the plans to do it. Well, that's 12 dudes. You now have to educate 250 million dudes. There's a scale issue. And China does not have an education system that generates people capable of creative thought in sufficient numbers to engage in a French style industrial espionage economy. The French could do it because they've been doing this for a very long time. And it's a sticking point in the relations with everyone. <laughs> uh, but with the Chinese, they came from a low base and their education system promotes obedience and memorization. And while there are roles for that in any economy, when that is your the definition of your workforce, it's just really hard to move up the value added scale. And even if tomorrow the Chinese invaded Taiwan, conquered it without destroying it, and they just walk into TSMC, uh, they couldn't operate those facilities. They'd just be paperweights. So this idea that China is this technological marvel that's going to take us over, I mean, it's just, it just ignores basic math, uh, which I also find amusing that it's an American argument. <laughs> well, we, we're, we're full of bad arguments. What can I say? Oh, yeah. We see these deliberate acts like bombing a civilian hospital during a ceasefire. What is the point of actions like this? What is the what's the desired outcome or potential strategy? It, it, it almost well, looks like I'd actually um, I think what's happening is actually worse. We know the Russians are capable of using precision guided munitions. It's not yeah. their primary, but they have them. I have seen nothing in the war suggests that if either they're either using them or if they are using them, they know how to use them. I've seen very few precision strikes at all. I've seen satellite photos of airports where there are 60 holes and only one of them is in the runway. Um, which tells me that the bombing of the, I'm assuming you're referring to the, the theater bombing and the hospital bombings in Mirapol over the last couple of days. Yeah. That just suggests that this is just part of a general civilian infrastructure destruction campaign, which is exactly what they did in Grozny, which is exactly what they did in Aleppo, and now they're doing it in Krakow and Mirapol and uh, Mikolaev and Kiev. And the goal is to destroy civilian infrastructure so utterly, so completely, that the population starves, that they feel that they have to go, and that anyone who stays to fight has nowhere to hide. That's what how the Russians have been doing war for 20 years now. So if they have precision capability, they're saving that for another day because it's just not relevant to this conflict at this point. There's a pre-show I asked you if you knew who John Mearsheimer was. If people don't know, we'll link the video in the show notes. But this is a guy who's a professor at, I think, University of Chicago. And his sort of thesis, his 20 million view video on YouTube says, hey, this is all NATO's fault. This is the West's fault because 
Putin's been warning us about Ukraine for years and saying, hey, I need this. It's a security buffer. Why do you keep poking me? And then finally, NATO went too far. Uh, and I'm wondering what you think about that, because it it does sound like, hey, maybe maybe we, NATO did go too far. Maybe we should have just left Ukraine alone. After all, maybe we did cause this problem. You know, it, it, it sort of gets in your head. And a lot of people agree with him. All right. So, um from the Russian point of view, they cannot be secure unless they control all nine of those gaps that I discussed earlier. Right. Mm -hmm. And when you look at what Russian threatened NATO with just before he launched the war, he listed all the countries that he wanted to be able to write their security policies and make sure that no NATO forces were ever in them ever. Belarus, Ukraine, Georgia, Azerbaijan, Armenia, Moldova, Romania, Bulgaria, Turkey, Czech Republic, Slovak Republic, Hungary, Poland, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Sweden. So you would have to give the Russians de facto control over the lives and security policy of a total population that is double that of all of Russians combined. So from a certain point of view, yeah, he's right, but that's still utter unmitigated horseshit. We will never admit, abide by that, neither would any of the countries in between. So essentially, he'd have to swallow all of Eastern Europe yeah. in order to I get I won't him. bother you if you give me everything I want and let me do whatever I want with these 300 million people. Oh, it's so many people. It's the size of the United States almost, right? I think. What are we, 330? I mean, yeah, we're, it's similar. Yeah. Uh, 300 million is too much. I'm sorry. Including the former Soviets here. You're talking about 100. Oh, you know, no, it's pretty close to 300 million. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So we'd have to give him control over the size of a country, the size of right. geography. And, and, and they population don't get size a the say in this. This is right. a deal between the United States and Russia. That's what he's saying. You can hand over the future of all of these peoples to us, and then we will be happy when we'll never ask for anything again. Yeah. No. Right. That sounds like World War II, except that also didn't work. And we ended up with the Cold War and the East the Iron Curtain, where people were literally dying to get over across those borders in those minefields because of the drain. That's that is that's insane. It Looking, though, at Ukraine now, his army couldn't even handle that level of occupation and control. So what? He would need a Secret Service also like the Cold War, where you just have repressive secret police well, in each of those countries. Putin has been playing a weak hand fairly well for the last 25 years. He's made threats and been able to get people to give him security advantages on the cheap. He certainly did that with Georgia. You know, when he, It's like he invaded Georgia while Putin and George W. Bush were sharing a box at the Olympics. So his timing has been good. His approach has been good. And he's gotten a lot for very little. But he reached a point where it was no longer a low-cost expansion. And now he's discovering that it's a little bit more involved. Uh, I don't think that's going to stop him, but it does mean that that strategy needs a new evolution. How long do we think this conflict goes? I know that's impossible to predict, but any, yeah, any I mean, guesses? If you had asked me five years ago, I would have said he would have captured Kiev in less than a month and the whole country in less than three. Now mm -hmm. I'm thinking that the whole country will certainly fall in less than six. Uh, but one of the... Uh, downsides, that's not the right word. One of the characteristics of this civilian obliteration program that the Russians are launching is it's not quick. Uh, it, it'll take several weeks to reduce cities the size of Kiev and uh, Krakow, uh, or Kharkov um, to rubble. That's a lot of ordnance, and the number of troops that he has in place in Ukraine is wildly insufficient to that task. So you should expect, in fact, I think we are seeing troop movements within Russia proper, moving many, many, many more forces to the border, and we'll probably have a Russian, a million Russian soldiers in Ukraine before the end of the year. Oh, God, that's so horrible. It's like watching... It's like watching Sarajevo, kind of, but in slow motion and on a grander scale. What yeah, do you think? Much grander scale. Yeah. And Sarajevo, uh, you know, it was Bosnia's mountainous. There were a yeah. lot of places for the rebels to hide. Uh, that's. It's not a perfect comparison when you're talking about Ukraine. Ukraine's got the farm fields, and so as long as there's vegetation and as long as there are buildings. Uh, the Ukrainians are going to be able to hide and snipe and participate in guerrilla war, which is part of why the Russians are going to destroy everything. Oh man, oh, it's just so awful. It's gonna it's it's gonna look like Western European or sorry, I guess Eastern European Afghanistan 2.0. It's just uh, this is going to be so brutal. Yeah, and, I mean, and we horrible. haven't seen anything like this in the world 
uh, since World War II. And even, even then, the closest comparison would be when the, uh, the Nazis were going to Ukraine and there were Ukrainian nationalists who sided with the invaders because they had just been through a several year uh, political repression, genocide, and uh, Stalin caused famine. And from their point of view, anybody was better than Stalin. Uh, and then when the Russians came back, uh, everything that the Nazis had not destroyed, the Russians then destroyed. That's the level of what we're looking at here. We haven't seen this since 1944. Oh man, oh, it's it, this is it's so it's so depressing um, and and so horrific. What do you think of Russia nationalizing U.S. and other foreign assets? I mean, it, it's a there bad a signal. Lot. What's that? I mean, it's not a great a signal, sure, but there yeah. just aren't a lot. Russia keeps most of its, uh, the Russian economy was so morbid that they kept most of their physical assets abroad because it was all about oil and natural gas sales, getting dollars and euros, and then, you know, investing them however you can. When it comes to American assets in Russia, I mean, I mean, I've said this to investors for years. You should be prepared for your Russian investments to go to zero because that's where this is going to go. That's not how it goes with every single Russian regime throughout recorded history. This one is no different. Uh, so when, uh, what was it, February 22, when the war started, uh, <laughs> things got locked down really quick. The day that the central bank was sanctioned, it's like, that's it. Everything goes to zero. Here we are. <laughs> uh, there, when you're talking of American assets in Russia, you're talking like the embassy? I mean, some oil sure. platforms, I guess, and stuff like yeah. that. Probably. Oh, oh, I see what you're talking about. Oh, okay. I, I was thinking American government. I'm sorry. I'm making fun of the wrong thing. Got it. Got uh, it. Yeah. <laughs> Switch yeah. targets. Yeah. Uh, so Shell and Exxon and BP are the three biggest investors in Russia. Uh, Shell and Exxon run the Sakhalin projects out in the Russian Far East. It's all offshore. It's all moving sea ice. The Russians are absolutely useless partners in there. So when Shell and Exxon decided to to back out, they're just shutting the projects down and that's it. By the way, a lot of that energy went to China. So China might actually end up getting less energy moving forward oh, wow. Russia, rather than more. Uh, and then BP was the partner with a company called TNK back in the 2000s, which eventually got bought up and gobbled into Rosneft. So they're now a minority shareholder in Rosneft. Uh, so the assets that the three of them have, it's highly questionable whether the Russians can operate any of them, certainly not in the case of the Sockland projects. So we're actually going to see, assuming nothing else goes wrong, Assuming no sanctions, assuming no boycotts, assuming insurance is unaffected, we're going to see an absolute reduction very rapidly in Russian output anyway, because the Russians' new projects that they brought in on the last 20 years, they're not in Western Siberia, they're in Eastern Siberia. They're smaller, they're deeper, they're more remote. And they, Russians do not have the technical still, skill to do it. They've been relying on Western companies. So... Will the Western companies who invested in this, this sector lose everything? Yeah, I'd, I'd argue they already have. Uh, but it's not like the Russians are getting much because they can't make any of it work. Mm. And I, we're going to see echoes of that through a lot of the Russian economy this year. I want to talk about poop, Peter, namely fertilizer. <laughs> um, how bad is this going to affect the food supply? Because I know that Ukraine it's is horrible. a producer. Okay, yeah, yeah Ukraine so and Russia. Our producers. Um, we have phosphate shortages because the Chinese are terrified about food shortages. So they've blocked all exports. That's going to last for at least the rest of this year, probably all of next year as well. We have a nitrogen fer fertilizer shortage because nitrogen fertilizer is synthesized from natural gas. We were already looking at high natural gas prices uh, nearing record levels before the Russian invasion. And Russia is also the world's largest exporter. So oh, a lot of fertilizer producers in, for nitrogen have already stopped operating in Europe because they can't afford the gas anymore. And then 40% of the world's potash comes from either Belarus or Russia, and that has now been stopped. Right. So we're looking wow. at a chronic shortage globally of all three. And we know that means that a lot of poorer farmers around the world are not going to use fertilizer or not going to use enough. And for everyone else, it's going to just be the single largest line item for them. So they're not going to be able to afford to do anything else. So we are looking at the beginning of a multi-year food shortage, multi-continental in scope this year. And of course, Ukraine is going from the world's fifth largest exporter to a net importer, and it will not come back for at least a decade. Wow. Wow. That's incredible. 10 years. But it totally makes sense. I mean, we'd have to start rebuilding tomorrow if we're going to get yeah. there, maybe even within that time frame. Um, 
the U.S. and Canada, I assume, will be fine because we produce a ton of our own slash get a bunch from Canada. But I don't know. Is that the Most, whole amount? Mostly OK. Uh, you're right. Canada is where we get most of our potash. We produce most of the nitrogen ourselves. And the phosphates that we don't source within North America either come from Morocco or Israel. And those supplies are, are safe. Um, but remember, uh, there is no tool to cut off American food exports. So food, at least for now, is still in a semi-globalized environment. And in that environment, you're going to feel the pain. Uh, but it's not like we're going to be dealing with food lines or food shortages here in the way that uh, Sub-Saharan Africa or maybe South Asia, maybe parts of China and definitely the Middle East. Man, we're going to have to rebuild we is in the Western, we have to rebuild that Black Sea port in Odessa, which I assume is going to be destroyed at some point. Yeah, um, as soon as Mikolaev falls, and I don't know when that's going to happen, but the Ukrainians have really been holding on to a degree that I would have never guessed was possible. But Mikolaev is kind of the last stop uh, on the on the road to Odessa. Odessa is the world's largest uh, wheat offloading facility. Um, Watch the bridge. There's one bridge through Mikolaev, and it's the only bridge between it and the sea. And then you have to go like another 100 miles north to get to the next one. If the Ukrainians blow up that bridge, uh, everything has a little bit more time. But that's about the only bit of good news, if that's the right phrase. Are we going to see Arab Spring like regime changes in countries that end up with this food insecurity? You know, oh, not, no, no. It's no. not going to be nearly that positive. Um, we're talking about food, oh. <laughs> food price increases that are significantly higher. We only had a tripling of food prices in the Middle East the last time we had any sort of disruption. This is going to be at least twice as bad. Really? Oh, my gosh. So Yeah, I mean, Russia's primary export market is the Middle East. Uh, Ukraine's secondary market is the Middle East. That's just not happening this year, and that's independent of the fertilizer program. Oh, my gosh. So what... That that knock on effects is probably a whole different podcast, but that sounds like this is this is really going to get yeah, really that's bad. A, that's a big part of my life right now is just figuring out how long it's going to take to get replacement systems up online. And I, you know, I'm not done, but spoiler alert: you're talking a minimum of five years. Oh my god! So we're going to see massive. St are we going to see starvation deaths or just massive civil unrest or both? You, you break down globalization, what, what, this, what this whole talk is just a very small part of it. You break that down, and yeah, uh, the, we've, ex we've exceeded the pre-industrial carrying capacity of the planet. It's only with fertilizers that we're able to keep 8 billion people alive. And so if you remove the industrial level inputs that allow that to happen, we will have famine. It will be worst in the Middle East. Uh, probably second worst in China because that system hasn't fully broken down yet. And then it's a toss up for number three between Sub-Saharan Africa and uh, India, Pakistan. Uh, and the only reason that India and Pakistan, I think are gonna come out of this okay, is with the first stop out of the Persian Gulf, so oil, natural gas, they're okay-ish. Uh, and they have uh, on multiple occasions shown that if they just throw a bottomless supply of people at their agricultural sector, they can get sufficient uh, production by substituting substituting labor for fertilizer. Now that has other economic problems, but it does mean that mass famine can be avoided to a degree. Oh, this is going to get so bad. Oh my gosh. What, what advice would, would you then have for the regular citizen in the East and the regular citizen in the West to prepare for what's coming? When you say the East, you mean like the Russian or the Asian space? I, I guess. Yeah. 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 India. Uh, well, I mean, India, some of the decisions that the Indians have made over the last 50 years that we look at as just economically silly, like every time the farmers throw a fit, they back away from whatever the modernization program was. Uh, and that has always been dumb in a globalized world. In a non-globalized world, that's actually pretty smart. Uh, I like to say that India has looked more or less like it has today since the time of the 5th century AD in the Hindu kingdoms. And nothing, nothing as small as the end of the world is going to change how India functions. This is just India. Um, in the West, what we think of as the uh, geography of agriculture is changing radically because not like, you know, they're, they're shutting down nitrogen fertilizer fabrication in Europe because they can't get the natural gas at a price point that makes sense. And then of course, phosphate is from the East and, um, potash is from the other side of a new iron curtain. So you're looking at that sp the, the European continent and all of the former European colonies having to radically overhaul how they even decide agriculture functions and how energy functions. And we're only in the very, very beginning of that unwinding. 
Do you think the U.S. will ban exports on U.S. oil to stem the oh, yeah. oil yeah, prices? Uh, Biden is a populist. Trump was a populist. Obama was a populist. You see a trend here. Yeah. Uh, and so if you have an American president who thinks he can ban the export of crude oil in order to protect American consumers from high oil prices, they'll absolutely do it. So we can have a floor on prices here of about 70 and a ceiling, I'm sorry, a ceiling here of about 70, uh, and a floor everywhere else is at least 150, probably closer to 200. Wow, wow. And that's in countries that are are developing so that, of course, they can withstand that type of price shock much less than we can here. There's, you know, we're talking about yeah. people going from people whining on their evening news about how much it costs to fill up their SUV to people who can't do and, you know, and then we will find <laughs> out just how engaged Americans want to be, because if we can show to ourselves that we can drop oil prices at the price of everyone else, we're an insulated economy, we're the military position of last resort and first resort for most countries, that puts the United States in a fundamentally different position than we were during the Cold War, where we had to carry the burden in order to fight the Soviets. Uh, if we decide to remain involved knowing that there's a high economic cost and very low payout chances, just doing it because it's the right thing. That's a different America. And that is the America, to be perfectly blunt, we haven't seen for the last 15 years. I would love for that to happen. I do not have high hopes. Yeah, that's that's very interesting. I mean, do you, can the EU take that mantle? I mean, they would have to, no. Germany is well, increasing their spend. I mean, everything is changing in Europe right now. Yeah. I mean, the Germans doubled their defense spending in three days after 25 years of whittling it down. Mm -hmm. So it's entirely possible that we could have this just complete change of attitude on Europe to all things, but it would take that. And we're going to have a situation in the not too distant future where the Russians are going to try to lever key NATO countries out of the coalition in order to prosecute the Ukraine war. We have to see what they do before anything else. They're going to try and what? Letter key? Uh, sorry. Um, Think of it as a crowbar. There's a couple okay. of pipelines that go directly to Turkey and Germany that won't be interrupted by sanctions, won't be interrupted by the war or sabotage. And the Russians will give the Europeans, excuse me, the Germans, and the Turks, the option of keeping the lights on in exchange for some security favors. Wow. Wow. What an entirely massive, disgusting mess this is. <laughs> <laughs> What about all these people talking about how the U.S. dollar, you know, might not be the reserve currency anymore because China and Russia and maybe India are starting to consider settling oil in, in different currencies? Sure. They're going to build their own block. What do we think of this? Okay, so um, I never treated that with much sincerity. Uh, and <laughs> the Russians are asking the Indians to pay for uh, the oil in rubles, and nobody wants rubles. Not even the not even the Chinese who technically have a currency swap agreement with one rubles. What you want for a global currency is a country that has a deep financial pool that doesn't care about the day to day motion of the currency. Uh, and honestly doesn't trade very much because then they'll have a vested interest. So any country that doesn't match those three is going to manipulate their currency to their own best interests when it comes to trade. So the idea that there's a power out there that is actively involved in the energy markets that can suddenly become this impartial arbiter is, is silly because there's nobody. Uh, the United States is kind of the perfect match because its energy needs are met within North America or within the United States proper for most things. So I, I really don't take it seriously at all. We talk about this every time that there's a turn of the page in history, but it, it really isn't there's no reason to expect a change. Perfect. Peter, there's so much more. We'll have to do another one with you. I'll, I'll pick up a couple of your books and read those, and we'll have an even more wide-ranging discussion. But I really thank you for your time and expertise. This is fascinating. Really no appreciate problem. it. If you're looking for a little bit more, the new book does come out June 14. The title is The End of the World is Just the Beginning. Great. Yeah, let's do another one for that book. Sounds good.